Uh, good afternoon. Um, I was asked to present some data from Peru, even though I've been in the U.S. for about 30 years now. But I train in Peru and I practice in Peru uh, uh, several years ago, and I have maintained a close professional relationship with the rheumatologist there. So, uh, for uh, those that are not well informed, Peru is in South America, and the largest city. Uh, I, where I point this? Okay, the largest city and the capital is, is Lima which is a coastal city, very spread, and it has about 30% uh, or a third of the population of Peru lives in, in the city. During the Civil War years, many of the people from the Andes actually went to Peru, uh, to Lima, and increased the population of Lima significantly, and the problems on, with health as well. Uh, we have several systems, really, but I want to focus only on two because I think are the most important networks. One is the Social Security Administration, uh, which is a, net, a network of systems that is well established. Uh, the system of referrals is quite effective. Uh, it has adequate resources. I wouldn't say excellent, but at least very adequate. And most expenses in terms of inpatient and outpatient service are covered uh, within guidelines, but they are really, uh, the patients will have access to the medications they need, hospitalizations, outpatient care, uh, laboratory work, etc. So in this setting, which serves really the working, uh, the work of population, uh, the physicians see about uh, 340 cases of lupus per year, they follow those, about 27 patients, new patients per year, and they, to serve those patients or that population, they have about 18 rheumatologists and two trainees. However, in the system, there is no dedicated lupus clinic, uh, but the nephrologist will be available on consultation only. The lupus, and I, that's the quote unquote, lupus medications will be available, and that includes not only the traditional, such as corticosteroids, cytoxin, imuran, etc., but also uh, the new medications, including the biologics. Uh, however, the rheumatologists cannot prescribe the medications outside their field, so they need to work in conjunction with the primary care physician if they are going to provide something like statins or antihypertensive medications, and that complicates, in my view, a little bit of the care of the patient, which I think the lupus patient ideally should be cared by one physician and not having to go uh, from place to place to get the different medications. In this setting, for the moderately active lupus, just like it has been said before, uh, it's really a matter of how, how sick the patient is. So usually we're talking about follow-up, excuse me, within uh, two, three months, and, uh, and then if the patient is quite stable, that can be increased to about every six months. The workup is all reasonable, you know, initial blood count, set rate, CRP, uh, laboratory for, for urinalysis, creatinine, and uh, a quantification of the protein uh, in the urine, APL antibodies, anti double strand DNA, and complement. And then afterwards, then we are getting only the really the essential laboratories, and uh, including the follow up of the urine on a serial basis. Can you get me some water, please? In the patient with more severe lupus, most of those patients are going to be hospitalized, and after the hospitalization, they're going to be followed for uh, every two weeks initially or more frequently if necessary. And then of course they're going to be followed uh, every two, three months. And then as the patient is stabilized, they're going to get into the next category. Uh, Obviously, the, the laboratory work is going to depend on what is the organ involvement. So if we have a patient that has a serious uh, kidney disease, then that is going to be the main thing. Whereas if the patient has primary lung disease, that's going to be the emphasis. So the very thing that is really done in this setting is quite reasonable in terms of what we know about how to follow a patient with lupus in, in developing or more or less constrained environments. Now, in contrast with that system, we have the system of the Ministry of Health. And the Ministry of Health actually serves the population who usually is not working, so it's not under the Social Security Administration system. And uh, it has uh, much limited resources. 
and uh, the system of referral is not really like a pyramid where you have the, the, the health center and then the mid hospital and the tertiary care hospital. Here you have the patients go as they, as they want or they wish or they can. So really there is no a specific system of referral where a patient is seen by the primary care and referred to the secondary physician and then to the tertiary care. Now, the problem, the main problem here is that the patients, for the most part, 50% uh, of the hospitalizations are not covered. In other words, only about 50% of the patients get her inpatient service covered if the diagnosis is lupus. And in addition to that, the follow-up of the patients, even though it's really relatively little, $2 per visit, the patient, that's little in terms of the U.S. economy or the economy of a developed country, but for a person that has a very limited income, those $2 plus the lab work plus the medications obviously result in a tremendous limitation in the care of these patients. Now, in this setting, the university hospital where I train and work uh, has, an, uh, in, oppo uh, in opposition to the uh, health care of the Social Security Administration, where anyone that works actually can access the hospital there, the system, here is uh, primarily the people in the northern outskirts where the university hospital is located. So you are talking about a much larger population. We're talking about over 2 million people living in this area. For the most part, they have a very low to middle low uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, status. Uh, however, the number of patients is about the same. Uh, they are follow about over 300 patients, and the num number of newly diagnosed is about the same in social security. They have a total number of rheumatologists uh, of only five and only two trainees. The difference here is that since uh, we started the lupus clinic in the 1970s in Peru, and that clinic has really continued to work, and it's an operation, and it has a nephrologist that works uh, hand in hand with the rheumatologist to provide the care. So in theory, things will work. Now, uh, the, the, the follow-up of the patient with moderate lupus and severe lupus is not really different from what we see in the, in the Social Security Administration. The only problem is that the main limitation is in the outpatient setting, the patient is going to pay for their labs, and therefore can, you cannot do anything that is expensive. And in the inpatient, if it's not covered, also the money is a problem. Now, just to give you an example, the cost of the medicines for induction of cyclophosphamide is cost about $100 for hydroxychloroquine at 500 per year. For chloroquine, it's about a quarter of that, so no wonder the patients are using chloroquine. chloroquine. And then uh, the use of rituxan, IVIG, plasmapheresis, only if there's some kind of support, external support can be given. Uh, so what in terms of outcome in this uh, constrained environments? Uh, we don't really have data for everything, but at least I have data in terms of uh, the, um, this, the mortality. Uh, this is mort the mortality data for very severe SLE, SLE for, from the Social Security Administration, and we had of 10 patients seen during 2009 that had severe lupus with an SLE of 8.4 and SDI of 1.4, with very severe features, three of those patients died. Now, we don't have kind of a survival curve for this setting. For the other setting, the university hospital, we have really a five-year mortality rate of 92% and eight years of 86%. And I must add that the five-year mortality rate really compares to the Lumina data uh, at the, at, at, in the US. So it's really, despite all the limitations, this is not too bad. So I just want to acknowledge the people that provide me the data from the Social Security Administration, the group of Dr. Acevedo, who is here in the audience, and from Cayetano Heredia, the group from Dr. Armando Calvo. Without them, we could, I couldn't have presented this information. Now, I must add just one comment is that uh, the care of the patient with lupus in the US, if the patient is uninsured uh, or has limited resources, uh, it's not very different from what I presented here because the same limitations will apply. Thank you so much.